My Aboriginal name, full Aboriginal name, Idum Duma. That's my name from Wellaroo country. That means because it's a dream for my mother, old lightning country. When the lightning hits a big noise with the two stone neck, it go bang, and that's what I mean now. Uh, Idum Duma. Thunder. Thunder. Bang. Do. Yanja Lachlan. That's what we say. That means. He went off, big bang, in the country. That means Lagla. Yeah. Your white name, Bill Harney, came from your father, who was a well-known Northern Territory identity. And he met your mother when he was putting the first road through to the town of Catherine. Yeah. Did they stay together long after you were born? Well, they looked after me together for about a couple of years. According to my mum, because the welfare was around the country and all Bill had to leave. He didn't want to let the people know that I was his son. You know, he sort of kept it quiet because the, the white people not supposed to be interfering with the Aboriginal women in the past, see? That's why old Bill told my mum, he said, all right, young Billy, if anyone asks you uh, who his dad is, tell him that I don't know what his name is. But old Bill was still coming back, giving my mother a few dollars in and all that. But mainly used to bring a lot of teen sugar and tobacco and stuff to keep us going, see? He used to sneak up in the camp in the night and give it away, you know, and all these sort of time. Now, your older sister, Dulcie, was taken away by police in 1940 and sent to Croker Island. How come you weren't taken away as well? Now, when the welfare was coming around, collecting all the other kids around the country, but it wasn't only me that there was the camouflage. The, the camouflage ourselves with the uh, charcoal was grind up, you know, and rubbed that all over the skin. And then we were black, sort of brownish colour, see? When the welfare come around, we'd be sitting around amongst the other Aborigines, we'd be just black as where they were. You know, they couldn't recognise at all. You were brought up by your mother's people, the Waterman people in their traditional tribal camp on the Willaroo cattle station. That meant that you spent your early childhood with the women. What did you learn from being with the women? Oh, the women used to go out every day. One lot of women be working. One other lot of women will go out fire cutting for the big house, like for the kitchen and stuff. Other Aboriginal women will go out hunting in the, in the hills and that, picking up lots of, lot of these big long yams. They go out and get the black currants, a white carrot, black, uh, green, uh, black plum and green plums and, you know, billy goat plums and all sorts of different plums that they pick it up. You know, and the, and the grapes, the bush grapes and all that. And how did that work in with the rations that you were given by the station? Well, um, didn't worry about much. When I got all the bush stuff, they didn't eat much of that ration at all. Even with us, when we came in from the stock camp, I was in a child. We put all our clothing back to the store, all our shirt, trousers, boots. We just put our cockroaches on. Then what was in the store, we left for the wet season with a mosquito net. And, and that's about all, we got the mosquito net out. But then we only took the ration only for a week from the homestead to go out bush. That was in October. Then after that, we just lived on the bush land, you know, till March. What language were you speaking? I was speaking really Waterman. I still speak my Waterman. Full Waterman I speak, yeah. When did you start learning English? Oh, I would have been probably 12 or 13 before I could speak good English. Not a good English, but good enough, you know? Just to, just to know a bit, and Gradually, I was very quiet, but I was listening a lot and picking up a lot of things in my own mind. There was one old Scotsman come along, and he sat down with me and he said, Bill, I'd like to uh, teach you something. You want to do a bit of schoolwork? I said, yeah. And he started drawing ABC, you know, and all these sort of type. He's teaching me how to spelling and all this. 
and I went on edge and spelling. Anyway, he said, uh, if I'm away, he said, you read tomato sauce. Well, read this. He said, that's me and tomato sauce. This is fruit. You take, you take the label off. And I used to take in a label off, put it in my pocket, and reading over and over, see? That's why I was become, uh, I could teach myself, see? I'm <laughs> reading in the night. I used to sit down and reading. And all. He taught me how to read and write. Old Peter Hogg was a charcoal and a fruit in label, see? Bill, at what stage did the Waterman men prepare you for initiation? When we was about uh, 12 to 13 year old, we was all went across to the single man cottages then, and that's when they tell us, right, oh, you got to stay still. Don't go anywhere near by the woman's place. This is you, the law. And we took notice of that. You know, they teach us for about, oh, probably two, three months, I suppose. Learning because there's a lot to pick up from the creation stuff. Then we had to sing all these songs. They gave me a song that I could stop the lightning from striking. They gave another song to another bloke could make it like a little cyclone to go. They'd sing another, they'd teach another young fella to make a big flood water be rising. Then they gave song to another young fella to make the flood water to go down faster. You know, and all these sorts of times. Were you pleased to be given the lightning oh, song? Oh, I was very happy when they given me uh, the lightning song to stop the lightning. Oh, I said, because it's for my mother dreaming, well, I can stop my mother and all. You know, that's what I said. And they're all laughing, see? <laughs> you won't be striking anymore. You, Mum won't strike me now, I'll say. I said, I can sing him and stop them now. And uh, they were happy, see, yeah. As part of initiation, you were circumcised and cut with tribal initiation marks. Did it hurt a lot? No, because with a stone knife. Stone knife doesn't hurt. The, the steel plate, anything steel, burns your skin. You know, if you cut like this, you'll burn the skin straight away. But with a stone knife, as soon as the, the stone knife hits the skin, it numbs it straight away, and you don't feel it. He sort of, it numbs it and just cut it off like nothing. After he got ill in three days, and week after that, or oh, you have to be ready to go down to the water. They'll plant all his eye like this, and run with him and throw him in the water. It was all old red oak, I see. That's all our red oak, all goes to the rainbow. Staying off that young boy goes into that spiritual place now, in the pocket in the, in the hole of the water, where the rainbow is. And then when he's drinking a big flood water, he can come along and jump in his water. He don't get attacked by a crocodile or, or get paralyzed. He can swim across, many crocodiles, and he can still swim across. Because that, he already had proper clearance, see. Your Aboriginal stepfather, Joe Gimonti, played a big part in teaching you about Aboriginal law, but Joe was a first-class stockman as well. Did he teach you about cattle too? Well, he taught me to become a really stockman and how, the, you know, how to go about it, night watching and watching out and make sure you look after yourself and all these sorts of types. Yeah? And then later on, when I picked it up from old Joe, I become a really good, smartest man in the, in the station property, and then I had a lot of pool and all this sort of time. And then, they, and then old Clary Wilkinson came in, and, and then later on, Clary Wilkinson was the manager of Bestie. He's been managing for Bestie for 40 years. And he saw what I was doing, and he, I was very reliable and active young fella, and knew what I was doing and all this. And then and I became a boss man when I was 17. And when you were 18, a marriage was arranged for you. How did that work? See, in a marriage it's with the Aborigine. He has to be married from the old to young, and young and old like this all the way. You know, uh, if the two young ones married up, they break the law, that's what they say, because they fight too much. There's no divorce in Aboriginal law. They've got to be married to stay together till that person die or a woman die, and then you get a younger one and all these sorts of talk. And that's what they did to us. Then in the middle there, they have what they call the straight skin. You have to marry the right straight skin. You don't marry half sisters, half cousins, or half auntie, half mother, and all that. You don't, because with us, many Aborigines from from here, the Alice Spring District to Western Australia, we have a tribal link, uh, tribal skin link up. You know, we got family like a family thing over there. We got mother and father. We don't know them, but. Our skinship find a relation. And so who was picked to be your wife? Well, uh, what was your white man's name? I forget. He wanted you with the Aboriginal name anyway. 
And how long were you married to her? I married her a couple of years because she had very old, you know, and she died for all. But, but she looked after me and everything, and I had a lot of respect for her because she taught me everything and told me everything. And so later on you got married again. Who did you marry then? Ida. Her name was Ida. And I got Roderick and Billy Boy out of her. Yeah. She was a really law lady because she was taught in the truth the Aboriginal woman law way and then also she was taught with the old blokes she was with. You know, all about the law side again and the women's laws and not to go out of hand and all this. And when we got together, we both knew all the laws, you know, and we were more or less like a two old law older, see? What happened to Ida? Well, she had a, um, I think she had a tumor. They call it a tumor, so doctor told me. She had a tumor in the brain when she died. And uh, the, I took a job on a place called Brimba with another old timer I knew, old Mick Elliott. He's a great old guy. Mm. And Mrs. Elliott took care of those two boys of mine in the big house and teaching them school and all this sort of time. I was doing a good job for them there, see? Anyway, because uh, later on when I left there and I uh, went over and did some saddling and I took the boys and then, and then I married Dixie, yeah, the one I got now. Yeah. So going back to your working life, you learn very well how to be a good cattleman and how to handle cattle in all ways. But you had a lot of other jobs too, didn't you? Yeah. Could you tell me about some of your other jobs? Well, uh, when I was uh, become a really good cattleman and all this, but again, back to old Clary Wilkinson, he was managing a place called Marakai, uh, for besties again with a buffalo shooting cab he had. All they were doing there is he's shooting buffalo for hides, you know. Anyway, and I was out there and then he took me out, he started showing me how to shoot a buffalo off a horse with his short 303 and kick like hell too. Then he fired the shot and the buffalo tried to uh, to kill old uh, Clary, but old Clary got up in his paper bark tree. And he was up in his paper bark tree, tree. and the buffalo was there shaking his paper bark and all this. And the old Clary said, oh, it's because he lost his gun was down the bottom, see, in the ground. He said, I'll fix this buffalo. He threw the match on him. He threw the match and he lit the grass, and the grass started coming on a flame, and the paper bark caught on fire, and a big flame went straight up in the paper bark, and the old, old Clary saw this big flame coming up, and he tried to piss on his uh, paper bark and couldn't put it out. Next, old Clary got burnt all around, and next he let go, and he just fell out of bread. And next to the buffalo, one buffalo heard the, something fell down next to him. The buffalo just took off, got a fright, you know. <laughs> and old flat Clary got up with his burnt clothes, racing up to the water <laughs> to, to have a wash and time. In the meantime, we got there then. Have you ever been crocodile hunting? Yeah, well, I was out crocodile hunting again. We were shooting crocodile for Jimmy R. Toy. And we was going out shooting many crocodiles. You know, all those little freshwater crocodiles. And then, then now and again we come across this big saltwater crocodile. You can see it coming. But we used to shoot the saltwater crocodile through the eyes. It blew his brains out. You know, but he doesn't roll over like an ordinary crocodile. But he just rears straight up in the air, about 20 foot, and come right backwards, see? And he used to rear straight up and he'll throw the boat away too, way out. And we used to have a little tomahawk ready. Just in case he tipped the boat over, we'll have a tomahawk to shove him up, see? And you weren't scared of the crocodiles, were you? No. Because you'd been protected from them by the rainbow. That's right. Well, I, like I wasn't you know, scared of crocodile. I can dive in any time. I was protected by the rainbow and all this. We used to dive down a lot, you know, those big rivers. You know, middle of the night, too. And you went timber getting, too, didn't you? Where was that? Went out right up in the tableland up top. And then, then we rigged the tent and everything, really out in the scrub, in a desert. And then and I went along and cut a stick, and the old bloke, he come up to me, he said, I seen you cut many trees, young fella, he said, but you're a good axeman, right? But I'll show you, I'll tell you what to do. When you finish cutting timber, he said, when you go home, to relieve your pain, he said, drink one nip of methyl every night. That's what he told me. I said, oh, OK. And I tried it, and he worked. I said, oh, good. That's part of the medicine. I woke up bright, shiny, you know, next day. You know, I could feel myself fantastic. And I said, oh, just the one nip of methyl. I said, oh, geez, that's really working. Bill, in the course of your life, 
you've witnessed huge change in the way Europeans and Aborigines have lived together on this land. Could you tell us about those changes from your point of view? Aborigine, one of the first settlers coming in the country because Aboriginal was already there. When the station had started to develop, and uh, those Aborigines sort of stayed there, but in that time, they didn't worry about any money. All they was getting the clothing, food, and the boots and hat and tobacco. They were happy. Whenever they string them all day, hard day work, any night when they knock off, you can hear them playing didgeridoo, doing a dancing and ceremony all night. That was their lifestyle, teaching their young children. When these ward wages come in and the government said everyone must get an equal pay, and the property owner said, we can't pay that many people. Too many here, look, thousand people, we can't pay them. We must ship all the clients in the town. You have to organise some funding to pay the people. And that's when they worked out the welfare funding. And then all the pastors said, well, kind of spoil them now. That's what they said. And which is true, you know, because they got money to run to the town, to the pub. They're not basing in the, in the, in the ranch with the cattle property to teach their young children about their own culture. This happened before land rights for Aboriginal people were recognised. If land rights had come before equal pay, would that have made a difference? That would have made it a lot different. If they left the Aboriginal alone where he was, they are the landowner, they knew. The parcelers got the lease on it, come in to buy it and go away. Another leaseholder come and all the way. But Aboriginal would have been based there, continue staying there, like they were in the past, and they, they would have had some labour there all the time. The later maybe they would have given some money to the younger people working and over, but not giving them any booze, you know. The grog, the one was a problem now, and the, and the wages bringing them in. And you now have right of access to your sacred sites, and that was because the law had changed. And the law had changed, yes. I said, oh, OK. And we recorded many sites, and when we went to Darwin, the hearing on that, uh, the Supreme Court, my case was just top. The land was just given straight away. Other people were struggling a bit because they didn't know their background, you know. And then we got our land, and that's how we are over there now. See, you see these uh, two lightning brothers here. They were children of two people who see uh, in creation time. They, the one of them is called uh, the Nade, he's up in the sky. They're the father of the lightning people. And the mother they had was the Dung Dung, with the frog lady. Anyway, uh, and they had many children who was part of the old lightning people. We say they've been in there right back from the creation time because we got a creation song and a story to relate to this, the lightning people in the rocks. But uh, some archaeologist people come around and they're documenting and carbon dating. What they were saying in, in this two here, they've been in there 10,000 years ago. That's what they said. But when our people did stop painting it 10,000 years ago because we got a creation song to upgrade them again you know, if we have to... Before we initiate the young boys, because they come and look at that, you're going to have some of these two in your shoulder that, that we just say to them. And they, uh, you don't say too much to them because otherwise they get fright, see? And they just explain it to them, what's that for? This one is for... Do you got to use that. When you have that, you can trade. And when you have this, you can sing ceremonial song. And when you have this, you can get married. But if you don't have this, you're not allowed to do this sort of thing. And that's what it's meant for. About the time that you were putting in your land rights claim, you set up your own fencing business. Were you at all worried about doing that? Because you'd never really been educated in the white man's way, had no, you? No, I wasn't worried about it because I have, a, I have a good connection with the finance side, figured the figures, the understanding the rule. You can't do this, you can't take that, otherwise you get into trouble from the tax man and all this. You've got to do it justified right way and all this. You know, I had a good accountant to go with and all this sort of stuff. Then when I was doing the fencing, I employed 18 to 20 people, you know, and where they were on full wages, you know, and I had a secretary. All I done was sign all the checks, pay them off and all this, you know. All everything in my brain, yeah. 
And then you got the idea of setting up as a tourist operator, running cultural tours on your land. Did you have any difficulty getting licence to do that? At first I said that you must have somebody been operating a tour would be able to teach you how to, to operate the tour. I said, no, I don't want anybody. I can do it myself. Then they turned around and said, oh, you have to have somebody do the cooking, you know, to feed the tour, tourists. I said, no, I do that myself. Then they said, oh, you have to have somebody to build your tour camp. I said, no, I can build my own camp. And all you going to come just have a look at it. They said, OK, whatever you said, uh, you go for it. You've achieved a lot in life, Bill. What do you think is the reason for your success? Well, I've always made my businesses always get on well with it. Any business people, the lawyer, the police, the shopkeeper, the shop owner, the accountant, the Aborigine and all this. I had a good connection, you know, uh, very flightly talk, nice talker. They want me to do something. If it's one o'clock in the night, I'll get up and do it. Someone come along and if I had something to do at two o'clock in the morning, I'll get up and do it straight away for them. You know, they're sort of things that I got in my system, and still today. You always seem to have enjoyed work too, haven't you? I did this sort of hard work all my life. I'm used to doing this sort of thing. You know, then I said, if I stop in, you know, with a crook leg or something, I get more sore. I got to stretch that out, release all that pain off and stretch it out a bit more to come good, see? I found that out of myself. Then, like, you know, and this old bloke told me to drink matho, and I had some few beer on top of that. When I was drinking a beer, I was going to work half stung and all this, but I'd go out and sweat it out when I was doing the concrete work. You know, and later on I said, oh, this is no good. I must give this booze away. I just stopped myself and, you know, didn't want to drink anymore. And uh, when they first opened up the, the license, policemen went around and encouraged every Aborigine. I was there in Catherine. Brought all the Aborigines in. They said, right out for everybody the pub. Open that for you. All free grog. You can go in and have a drink. And they spent two days of it just drinking. To teach them how to drink grog. They shouldn't have done that, but that's what they did. It was free grog for two days. And later on, they stopped them then and they could go along and buy it then. By then, they got used to wanting to drink grog, more grog. Then they continue on to non-stop, you know. Bill, what do you think is the answer to the grog problem? Well, the answer is, I think it's uh, just the people, Kate community, they should be all raided back to go back to the, to the homeland. Come in, might be spent a week in town like we did in the past, then go back. That's the best way, you know, to, to re-establish them with the culture. And they just take them here for a couple of weeks and take them back for three months or two months. You know, to teaching their young children how to go, to go about their own law. Are the young people being initiated now? Oh, there's, there's a lot of, no, not a lot, because they're all hanging in town, just wait till we go out, see? There's a lot of them just unbranded, they call them. Unbranded? Unbranded, yeah. Unbranded means like it hasn't been initiated. Then other young fellas had been in town so long, again, didn't go through the law, just wait for them to grab them now. But when we work in this uh, tribal law council, that will pick him up and then take him back. Now, there's a lot of use of the word reconciliation these days, between black and white, between Aboriginal and European. <laughs> what do you think of that? You know, with this reconciliation thing now they're talking about, the reconciliation that they're talking about, like between the white and the part Aborigine and the, and the Aborigine themselves, and uh, what we saying, we in the middle, just like the, just like the the donkey over there served the horse, and bred mule in the middle. That's we a mule now in the middle. Aboriginal is still standing there with the law. White people standing there with the law. There's the two law one on each side. The the, the right hand side when the white man has a lot of the knowledge and and the eye speaker. Aboriginal have a lot of laws and understanding. But they're very low, silent, sacred speaker. They don't let everything out uh, publicly. They keep it under, you know, all this being under. And they, uh, but there's a bloke in the middle of the mill. He's the main spokesman there for the both sides to put everything together. 
making a connection like me now, you know, understanding the two law. Now this reconciliation there, yeah, we've been following up, we're saying, what's that mean? It seems to me it's what you've lived all your life. You've been bringing the two sides together all your life, haven't you, Bill? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm.